So, does anybody have any questions for these three? Any more questions? I know that some people have a lot of questions for Ted. And, oh, go ahead. Okay, here. Um, maybe this one is for Ted. Um, about the basics of transhumanism. What's the role of consciousness evolution in transhumanism? If, if there is any concept. Just give us one second. We're going to get the volume going here. Testing one, testing two. Who wants to take it? You can help me by telling me uh, what you mean by consciousness uh, evolution. If it's what I think it is, uh, consciousness evolution, part of the co-evolution concept, uh, was there before transhumanism entered into uh, the conversation. Um, right now, I don't see a connection unless somebody knows more. Um, uh, tell me what you mean by consciousness evolution when we think about our spiritual consciousness? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, uh, the consciousness evolution, consciousness co-evolution, it's been around for about four decades or so and um, uh, is shared by New Age uh, spirituality here with some uh, components from uh, India. Sri Aurobindo would be a good example of that where you have um, uh, evolution and then what he called involution as uh, matter and spirit uh, gained a higher level of emergent holism. And I think that that was just independent of the rise of the transhumanism movement. And uh, the transhumanists are really concerned about intelligence um, and not necessarily, I think, what, um, what the consciousness movement really had in mind, namely that uh, profound inner sense of my uh, unity uh, with, uh, with all material things. Let's add something real quick. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, the text, it's not out there, but I'll get it. It's by Ted Chu that we were talking about before. That's a core... Um, premise of his, of his idea of transhumanism, <coughs> and he calls it Conscious Evolution 2.0. So this is the new phase of transhumanism, and as part of this, it's interesting that Barbara Marx Hubbard, who kind of really coined the term Conscious Evolution, has teamed up with Ted Chu, and they're going to be speaking around the country together on evolution of consciousness and, and conscious evolution as the new, the new phase, the next phase of, of transhumanism. Take another question. I'm, I'm going to touch this afternoon on uh, my interest in consciousness and what it could mean for transhumanism. I will get into that at 4 or 4.30 whenever I end up up there. Um, related to that question was my uh, question regarding the Turing test. I, I, I'm wondering if you see the Turing test as, uh, as assuming something not exactly established in terms of the the mind body problem. Um, I have a feeling that there m that there could be something more to us than Newtonian, and if that's the case, while we're while we're trying to find out how to uh, enhance ourselves or perpetuate ourselves with technology, if we skip that part, we might find that we have an aut automaton that looks a lot like us or that is having some of our information characteristics, but might, uh, the light may go out for who we are, <laughs> and I'm not talking about magic, I'm talking about something that might require a deeper physics. Um, the point I had intended to make was really a very limited one, namely Noreen Hertzfeldt uh, was advocating that we have an interactive or a relational understanding of the human mind. And uh, she thought, rightly or wrongly, she thought that the very fact that we employ the Turing test to find out whether something is intelligent or not fits the relational model. Um, 
I'm not in a position to judge as to whether or not the Turing test should play this decisive a role with it in computers. I, I don't know. Question in the back. Uh, hi, I'm real interested in your the radical uh, proposition you put forth that the Christian Trinity now includes the sacred feminine, which sort of historically has not been part of it, and how that might change the narrative in the future? This is for Byron, I think. We didn't get to that, those slides, but the Urantia book states that, that the divine person, um, uh, the creator, is both male, female at the local universe level, at the transcendental central of the universe uh, level, there's no gender differentiation in deity, but the local space-time creators are come in pairs. So Adam and Eve are like a reflection of, of the pair. And in the Urantia book, <coughs> there's the mother Jesus. There's a, there's a female Jesus and a male Jesus. So the incarnation of Jesus is, is incarnations are what males can do, deity males. And females don't incarnate, they don't have to incarnate because in the Urantia theology, all of space is the feminine. <laughs> so they're already incarnate. So the males incarnate into that. So there's two teachings, there's the feminine Gaia aspect and there's the masculine um, uh, aspect of deity. So it's, it's very much in the theology. Couple questions over here. Oh, in the far back. Um, we'll do one, two, three. Is that okay? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious, so um, I think a lot of us turn to religion, whether it's like a personal practice of yoga or an organized religion like Islam, to make sense of our suffering and hopefully to bring about its end. And I'm just curious if you could speak to what um, Tarasim and the other um, philosophies being presented, what they kind of offer us in this space time, what this means for many living humans, um, given you know, where we are today as a planet and peoples. Um, so, I mean, first thought I had was, you know, off what, what does terrorism have to offer in this space? I mean, I thought you were like referring to like some type of miracle or something that terrorism could perform. But, um, I mean, it does, I mean, terrorism doesn't offer anything supernatural. Like mainly, yoga and um, and the truths of terrorism are just for inspiration and for physiological s stress relief. And that, combined with um, a belief a belief set about the ultimate destiny of the universe, would be more meaningful, um, you know, for people today as opposed to you know. Um, other forms of ancient yoga based off of ancient traditions which don't resonate with modern people's values as much. Oh, we'll, we'll take one back here, and then we've got uh, two there, and then two there. Hi, I'm Wesley Smith. I'm going to be writing about this conference for First Things Magazine, uh, which is a more or less conservative religious journal. And I'm, uh, I think Jason really hit what I have been sensing all morning is that uh, I've always thought transhumanism has been a way of trying to replace what has been lost with the loss of religious faith in a secular world. And Jason has said, we're going to make up our own religions uh, and, and then have subgroups that will interact with each other, which I thought was right on the nose. And I would like to ask um, Ted, uh, it seems to me that what's happening in this approach is that rather than having people uh, adhere to the maxims of their faith, they're having their faith adhere to their own personal maxims. I'd like your comment on that. I want to be certain I've uh, got your uh, question uh, correct, uh, Wesley. Um, in my description of the religious dimensions of transhumanism, am I saying that, and now could you just repeat that <laughs> so that I'm sure I got it? Nicely done. That was a good slide. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, it seems what, what I what I'm sensing is that rather than having, in terms of the transhumanist approach, rather than people fitting themselves into the faith precepts of their faith, they're having their faith, they're fitting their faith into their own desires, their own beliefs, and so forth. So that it's, it's really, uh, you could end up with, if you really went all the way, 300 billion, uh, not 300 billion, uh, 7 billion different religions if each person creates their own faith and, and invents their own religion and, and their own idea of transcendence, whether it's material or, or it's spiritual, uh, you're not going, it's kind of like a, an anarchy in a sense. That is, I will make my religion what I want it to be. I will decide what right and wrong is based on what I want, as opposed to, say, the traditional mo uh, monotheistic faith where people uh, fit themselves to the precepts of their faith. Um, I think that um, that would fit what uh, Jason uh, had described about himself. If Jason felt like he needed, uh, after trying existing uh, religious uh, options, he needed to create his own. If that were to be a generalizable principle, yeah, we'd have seven billion um, religions. I think there's a coherence to transhumanism. There's a handful of fundamental philosophical or doctrinal commitments. Ultimate reality is physical. It's evolutionary. It's got a past and a future. You and I are morally obligated to enhance the evolutionary future. So it would seem to me that even though there are no creeds, although the transhumanist manifesto comes close to being a creed, you would either say, yes, I believe in transhumanism, or no, I don't. Um, so I, I don't see that as a person making up his or her own uh, religion, but it's actually joining a movement or staying out of a movement. I think in the larger context, especially after the Second World War, but it was already going on in the late 19th century, that as Western culture becomes more and more scientized and materialized, and people begin to drift away from classical religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and to a lesser extent, uh, Islam, many of the things that we had gotten from these religious traditions, now we ask science and technology to deliver. We ask uh, actually a number of things in our secular life. For the most part, nationalism and patriotism give us a lot. Uh, they give us a substitute religious community, for example. But when it comes to salvation, good health, well-being, human fulfillment, science and technology just look like they can deliver uh, what our religious traditions used to promise, but for one reason or another, we, we don't think we can uh, get from them. I think that's what's going on, and transhumanism is not unique in that regard. It's an example of a number of uh, secular ways of thinking in which discarded religious beliefs come back in a disguised, scientized uh, form. I think that that's, that's what I see. So I had real quick for what it's worth. Your answer book is anti-dogma and states very explicitly, no creeds. Everyone is encouraged to create a personal philosophy of religion in their special sections in the Rancho book about that. And it um, discourages priest, priests and cults and states all of this is a framework, it's not a belief system, to utilize for your own personal spiritual philosophy, uh, which is God-centered. So I think the Unitarian Universalist Church is the best model for allowing, you know, a large variety of diverse belief systems by um, encouraging everyone to pursue their own spiritual path and, you know, 
yes, uh, seven billion people can have seven billion different varieties of um, spiritual beliefs. And also like addressing, um, you know, religious transhumanism um, as being an answer to um, life's problems. I like part of my speech was also not just about um, providing a new answer, but also rebelling against um, the secularization of popular culture and the apparent nihilism in a lot of the pop culture um, memes and ideas that we're supposed to um, be uh, be passionate about, like a lot of the music that's on the radio today that's popular. And uh, I think you know a lot of religious communities feel the same way that they want to keep their kids away from you know listening to Jason Derulo's um, songs and. Um, and I think there definitely could be the same thing exis existing within transhumanism. Jason, let me ask you about your own existential working this through. What dissatisfies you about the secular interpretation of things is it's meaningless. It is nihilistic. And to some extent, transhumanism risks that, but Transhumanism finds meaning in evolutionary direction. Now, when you created your own religion, did you have to invent your meaning or were you able to find meaning? In short, I did both. Um, you know, I looked for similar ideas in Nikolai Fyodorov, uh, Sri Aurobindo, and also Teresa and when I found out about it. And, um, you know, to the extent that people's ideas are always the same, but always evolving. Um, I, I didn't create my own religion. I just, you know, created a hybrid version of previous traditions, just like the Hegelian dialectic. But in a sense, I did create my own tradition in that the exact same thoughts were not thought of before. Got about two minutes, um, one here, and then if we have time, one in the front. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm new to uh, transhumanism, so my first exposure to it was the uh, very first conference in San Francisco. Uh, so I could be wrong in my assumption, but what it seems uh, m in my exposure to it, there's a lot of emphasis on, for example, human extension. Uh, there's lots of talk about an indi the individual, and there's lots of talk about humankind. There's really not a lot of addressing of actual groups within societies and cultures. Uh, uh, groups that are typically discriminated against, and we could cut that up by looking at uh, race, uh, gender, and class in America. So I guess my question is, is you know, if, if there are these great technologies that can achieve life extension, so on and so forth, uh, what's to stop there from um, um, that uh, of uh, groups historically not able to access things like even health in the United States? What's, what's, uh, what does transhumanism, I guess, have to, I haven't heard anything that transhumanism has to offer philosophically in addressing these kinds of inequalities and in, 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 in equal access to these new technologies. So I guess I was wondering, um, uh, particularly to Ted and Jason, but perhaps also you as well, um, you know, for one, what can religion or historical religions offer in terms of some kind of social justice uh, aspect, what can they offer to transhumanism? And also, what can terrorism offer um, to address inequalities and in access to these potential uh, life-enhancing technologies? I'll start. Actually, this is probably a better question for Hank um, uh, than it is for me because I have to be descriptive. But if I were a transhumanist, I would answer you this way that the fundamental structure of the tra transhumanist thought is from the individual to the whole. And you're talking about groups in between, dominant groups, subordinate groups, rich groups, poor groups, uh, discrimination, injustice. A uh, transhumanist is going to say, look, with our technology, we're going to improve the climate, the environment. We're going to improve what happens in the inner life. There is nothing that would lead directly to changing the injustices uh, between uh, groups and segments of society. 
Traditional religions can be very concerned about injustice. Why? Well, they came out of tribalism for the most part. Uh, they're used to one group relating to another group. So issues of social justice are going to be much more on the minds of traditional religions than they will on the minds of transhumanists. That doesn't mean transhumanists are immoral. I'm just saying that happens to be where I think uh, the vision is at work. And Jason, I don't know if you think like I do or differently. Well, actually, terrorism has a ritual that's exactly what you describe. There, in March, there's something called the Freedom Seder based on the Jewish um, Passover Seder. And in that Seder, um, uh, we in Terrorism recount tales of freedom from slavery and also um, connect that to how society is currently advancing through um, telecommunications and more interconnectedness and uh, more awareness of each other and more boundaries being broken, such as you know those in the transgender community. And you know that's part of how we can connect the past to the future as far as you know past religious traditions and a, you know a new synthesized religion which is you know becoming popular today. I was putting on my transhumanist hat. Um, I think of transhumanism as unsustainable because it does not have um, this outreach in the sense of social gospel Christianity to the masses, to, to, to the poor. It is nothing like that, and I think it's hopeful that you guys are thinking about that, but otherwise it is, in the future, tra the elitism of transhumanism will become more and more salient. If you want to see an example of that at the thrivemovement.com website, there's a pretty big attack against my author, Ted Chu, by um, Foster Gamble, uh, because this is an elitist ideology, will be imposed on, on the masses, and there's nothing in it for the poor, for the oppressed. In fact, it's going to be a tool of oppression. So I think it's really a highly uh, volatile situation with transhumanists in the future as, as there's a global uh, you know, uh, uh, upsurge against uh, uh, technological elitism, which is the way it's going to per be perceived outside of forums like this. Ted Chu speaks of the worship of evolution itself. Cosmic evolution should be worshipped. So it's post-human because it, evolution goes beyond the human. So this is easily misunderstood. Um, and I, I, I want to tell you that he is a humanist. But you don't get that unless you do your homework. So he's now being depicted as an oppressor. And um, I think there's a big correction that has to come in transhumanism. And this conference is an example of that correction, actually. <laughs>